Metro Exodus is a 2019 first-person surface rat simulator developed by 4A Games. Exodus is the third mainline entry in the Metro series, and follows Artyom and his crew of Spartan Rangers as they flee the Moscow Metro and journey through post-apocalyptic Russia and Kazakhstan on a locomotive called the Aurora. The objective? Connect with the alleged remnants of the former Russian government and find a cozy, ideally radiation and mutant-free spot on the surface where they can start rebuilding civilization from scratch. Of course, that's easier said than done as shit hits the fan not five minutes after fleeing Moscow. First, the locomotive breaks near the Volga River, where the rangers encounter and fight a Lovecraftian coded technophobic cult. Near the dried out Caspian Sea, a vicious warlord has assumed control of the area's remaining oil and water reserves. As for the remnants of the Russian government, well, uh, I'll save that for later. Exodus might seem like a huge departure from the series' core tenets, but it's not that big a departure as some would think. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We got a lot of ground to cover here. So much ground. Oh boy, this is gonna be a video. So let's dive in and see what Exodus is about. Also, I have a Twitter with tweets and a Patreon where you can support the channel with real life money. Let's go. Metro Exodus takes place one year after the events of Metro Last Light. After the vicious red line attack on D6, a bitter and disillusioned Artyom leaves the Spartan Order to pursue his side project full time, proving that other people outside Moscow have survived. To that end, Artyom makes numerous expeditions to the surface. Despite nearly dying each time, Artyom, the absolute epitome of the your unemployed friend on a Tuesday afternoon meme, is relentless in his pursuit of the truth. So relentless in fact that the first thing he does after receiving the nth emergency blood transfusion is to journey back to the surface. Eventually, during an expedition with his wife Anna, yes he's now married to Miller's daughter, as in the daughter of the leader of the Spartan Order, in case you were wondering how Artyom received so many blood transfusions, the answer is nepotism, they notice a fully functional functioning train running on the surface. A real, honest to god, actual train going choo choo and shit. Before long, they and a group of survivors from outside Moscow are captured by Hansa troops. Shockingly, the troops execute the survivors on the spot, shoot and leave Artyom for dead and take Anna hostage. Looks like nepotism by marriage can only get you so far. Artyom. Anyways, Artyom follows the Hansa soldiers, saves Anna, and stumbles across a computer. And not just any simple computer, but a signal jammer that was blocking radio communications between Moscow and the outside world computer. Yes, Artyom was right all along. The destruction was not total. It was all a scam created by Big Metro to sell a... I don't know... Flashlights? Artyom and Anna destroy the signal jammer and proceed to steal one of Hansa's locomotives, later named the Aurora. As they attempt to flee Moscow, the Spartan Order intercepts the locomotive and are shocked to discover that the terrorists causing all the ruckus are none other than Artyom and Anna. Knowing that Hansa will execute them for discovering the truth, Miller orders the Hansa soldiers shot and they all flee Moscow. Outside the city, Miller drops a bombshell revelation. He and other Metro higher-ups were in on the scheme all along. He explains explains that while the bulk of Russia's major cities were bombed, the war is still ongoing and NATO has occupied what remains of the country. In response, the Russian government decided to secretly jam all communications to make the outside world believe that the entire Russian population is now radioactive sludge. As if on cue, the group receives a radio broadcast from Moscow Defense Command urging all survivors to come to ARK, a secret base located at Mount Yamantau. Knowing that their most recent transgressions would get them executed should they ever return to Moscow, Moscow, Miller decides that their best chance is to go to Ark, where he believes the Russian government has rebuilt itself. Well, about that. Let's put a pin in this for now. So, what can I say, they really ramped up the political intrigue in Exodus by adding this conspiracy angle. It's a very... Eastern European spin on an already heavily Eastern European coded franchise. Let's Put it that way. So yeah, it's a great start to a great story, but we have other things to talk about until we get to the finer details of Exodus's world. So let's talk gameplay. Bullshit. You don't play shit. Are you pushing the right buttons? Do you think I'm a fucking idiot or what? These fucktards just went and mess with the fucking thing. Why the fuck did they even have that? Hey, you asshole. Why did you have it with you? You aren't supposed to touch things like this. We were taking the satanic contraption to the house of the Zarfish for purification and protection from it. To the fucking terminal? Damn, you're fucked up. To throw such a great thing out. Hear that, Tullian? I fucking did. The thing ought to be trash, though. See, it spins the tape, but don't play fuck. Could it be the batteries? Hey, you, do you fucks have fresh batteries? 
No! Electricity is a sin! Ungodly technology is a sin! Shut the fuck up, you piece of shit! Maybe like this. Fuck me if I know. Looks like this is doing nothing. Should we just swap it for something good with the boys? It does spin the tape and all. Ah, uh, who the fuck wants a broken piece of shit? Fuck it. Much like 2033 and Last Light, Metro Exodus is a first-person shooter with flight survival horror mechanics. If that sentence sounds derivative of previous videos, well, that's because there are only so many distinct ways to describe game with shooty shooty where you get big boo-boo if not wear gas mask. With Metro Exodus, 40 Games wanted to take the franchise in a new direction. As such, unlike 2033 and Last Light, which were mostly linear, the game includes several large semi-open spaces for players to explore. Now, moving the action from the Moscow Underground to the surface was a huge risk on 4A's part, but a necessary one in my opinion. 2033 and Last Light's dread-inducing tunnels were a masterclass in atmosphere and world building, sure, but there is only so much one can do with that setting. They also had to address feedback from players who wanted larger spaces and more exploration and choice. Since the team had previous experience working on Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, a franchise whose future, at the time at least, looked shaky at best, it was the perfect time to officially and definitively fill the void left by Stalker by blending Stalker's freeform gameplay with Metro's linear mission-based design. And since there is an undeniable artistic lineage between 2033, Last Light and Stalker, you could say that, in a way, things had finally come full circle with Exodus. Here's the thing though, while one could argue that Exodus's Stalker type design is the game's main selling point, that's not all there is to it. In my opinion, the main draw is not so much the inclusion of open sandbox style spaces, as how 4A games molded the formula to fit in with the ethos of the series. That seems virtually impossible to achieve without diluting the core Metro experience, but 4A games found a way to strike this very delicate balance. Exodus is not a fully open world game, it's essentially a linear, mission-based first-person shooter in an open world game-shaped trench coat. That's not to say Exodus is a full open world or anything like that, it's just that by limiting its scope and size, the devs were able to seamlessly blend the freedom of movement provided by open world games and the curated, detail-oriented, story-heavy, immersive nature of 2033 and Last Light. We try to design everything very naturally. That comes from a core belief and a core design strategy that the studio has in all aspects of game design. The weapons are very realistic. Our weapons guys are sort of engineers, so they've all been designed to be mechanically feasible. Even those cobbled together things that don't exist at all are mechanically sound. The environments are designed specifically. Even within a house, when an environmental artist goes in and places all the objects inside the house, it's not just, oh, this is a table, so we're going to put stuff on it. We ask, who lived here? And they think in their mind who lived here, who was here last, and try to make it feel like it actually existed, and there was someone here before you showed up who wasn't just a level designer. This hybrid approach allowed the devs to design everything like weapons and environments very naturally and specifically. This allowed the devs to signpost things more naturally and by extension keep the HUD as minimalistic as it was in previous games. And also reintroduce those micro immersive mechanics that I've been yapping about in the last uh two videos? Take how Exodus does navigation. It lacks any form of minimap or objective markers. Instead, as the player explores the open spaces, Artyo marks points of interest in the map with his adorable little pencils. The map in turn is a tangible in-game object attached to the back of Artyom's journal that he needs to pull out of his backpack and check to get his bearings. To see objectives, simply flip the map and there they are. For easier moment-to-moment -moment navigation, a compass that displays the direction of objectives can be attached to the wristwatch. I love how involved this whole process is. No objective markers, no minimap to pull me out of the game, just me, my map, my piece of shit Metro made assault rifle, and the nuclear horrors beyond human comprehension. Again, this was made possible by the studio intentionally scaling back the world size and segmenting it. Had the world been even 25% bigger, I pulled that number out of my ass, concessions would have had to be made due to scale. The bigger the world, the harder and more expensive 
fine posting things naturally becomes, as this requires investing precious dev time and resources into assets and design, thus incentivizing the introduction of objective markers and, you know, stuff like that. Anyways, most of the sweet micro mechanics from previous games return to Exodus. Artyom's wristwatch has a timer that shows how long until the gas mask's filter expires, after which it needs to be replaced. Players must wipe off dirt and blood that collect on the gas mask. Gas masks have a chance of breaking when damaged and the player can repair them using duct tape. Also, because Artyom is now fully modeled instead of a gun floating through the air, movement and exploration have a nice sense of physicality and momentum to them. You can feel Artyom's every step and the weight of the equipment he's carrying, especially when sprinting. I'm not gonna lie to you, Exodus's movement does take some getting used to. It's an acquired taste. It either feels natural and realistic or wonky as fuck, there's no in-between. With the setting now firmly outside the metro and in the vast expanse of post-apocalyptic Russia, the game's economy had to be completely overhauled. Gone are the colorful merchants and cozy hub locations, as well as the military-grade ammunition that served as the metro's de facto currency. Now you must scavenge for resources, namely chemicals and materials to craft consumables. Gas mask filters, medkits and certain types of ammunition can be crafted on the go by using Artyom's backpack. Or borrowed from ruins or fallen enemies. Regular ammunition must be crafted at workbenches on the Aurora. With materials and chemicals, players can also repair gas masks and clean weapons. Now, as crazy as 2033 and Last Light's weapon designs were, Metro Exodus takes it a step further. They're not so much weapons as they are stupidly elaborate contraptions Frankensteined out of weapon parts. What even is a weapon, you may ask? Metro Exodus' answer to that question is, Yes. One time, frustrated at my inability to take over a heavily defended radio tower, I deployed my backpack and engineered an improvised sniper rifle, scope, silencer, barrel and all out of a pistol stock. Speaking of which, I honestly hadn't realized what a game changer Artyom's deployable backpack is until writing this script. The simple fact that I could change my loadout and craft basic consumables on the go without having to backtrack to HQ was enough to encourage me to experiment with new weapons and attachments. Need to scope some fools from a distance, just whip out your backpack and attach a long-range scope to your assault rifle. Or even better, improvise a sniper rifle from scratch like the one I mentioned earlier. Wanna go stealth? Attach a silencer to your weapon. If you need a shotgun for close-range combat, well, there are options for that too. Or you can wait until later in the game to get the Uboinic and customize it to your heart's content. Exodus offers so many weapon variations and customization options that I could literally spend 20 more minutes on this topic and still not run out of things to say. It's honestly one of the best crafting slash weapon customization systems I've seen in a video game and I say that as someone who isn't too big on looter, crafter, shooty games in the first place. If you like scavenging for shit in games, this game is crack. Metro cracks at us. I'm not editing that joke out. Much like in 2033 and Last Light, enemies consist of a few human foes and mutants. Humans will keep for the stealth section for obvious reasons. Mutants, on the other hand, are a bit trickier to deal with because unlike the previous games, they're a lot smarter and you'll have to change tactics depending on whether you're facing them in enclosed spaces such as tunnels and the like or outside. Take the Watchmen, or Watchers as they were known in the Moscow Metro. They are a grotesque mutated species of large mammal, possibly of canine origin. They travel in packs, a reason for which you'll often see them calling for each other, and possess cat-like reflexes. They're a bitch to deal with. In the cramped environment of the metro, packs of watchers were relatively easy to contain by simply retreating to a strategic position and picking them off one by one. Outside, they'll run circles around you, attacking and retreating repeatedly and gorilla-like patterns until you eventually run out of ammo. So how do you deal with them outside? Run. I'm not shooting you. Run or wait for nightfall and sneak past them. They're not worth the effort. Most mutants don't drop any loot, so by fighting them, you're straight up wasting precious ammo. If sneaking is not an option, simply attach a silencer to one of your primary damage dealing weapons, ideally a shotgun, and try your damnness to take one out without alerting the others. The same principle applies to lurkers. They too are pack animals that attack in swarms. Avoid them. Demons, the giant bat-shaped monstrosities relegated to scripted events in 2033 and Last Light? Guess what, bucko, now they roam the skies freely and can snatch you at any time. Avoid them. If one spots you, run towards the nearest shelter and pray to the gods it doesn't catch up to you. Shrimps? Well, you have no choice but to shoot them. If you followed my advice, you should have enough bullets to break through their thick shells. Humanimals? <laughs> Sorry, I can't say this with a straight face. 
Oh man, I, I love when insert media does that, let's call them zombies, but without actually calling them zombies thing, but it's always something whack like lurkers or lame brains. Yes, I'm looking at you, the walking dead. <laughs> Humanimals. <laughs> Anyways, so they're zombies, but not only do they travel in packs like regular zombies, but they also walk on all fours and throw shit at you. In the Caspian level, they will hide in the sand and sneak attack you. A well-placed headshot should be enough to waste them. These are some of the mutant types you'll encounter in Exodus, and in case you're wondering, yes, the creepy spider-scorpion hybrid returns, and they're more vicious than ever. Metro Exodus' stealth is a huge improvement over 2033 and Last Light. For one, given the more open levels, the mostly functional but overall janky AI system that controlled enemies in the previous games wouldn't cut it anymore, so 4A games overhauled it. Thankfully, it's much better this time around. Enemies behave naturally, are better coordinated, and do a great job of putting constant pressure on the player by sharing information about Artyom's location. Most crucially, moments that made me go, yo, where the fuck did that come from, were few and far between. Unlike the previous games where human foes had the behavioral consistency of a golden retriever zonked out on cocaine-laced kibbles. This is great news, especially since using stealth tactics is not only encouraged, but absolutely mandatory for unlocking the good ending. In the first draft of my Metro Last Light script, I spent like two pages bitching about the karma system and how gathering enough good boy points to unlock the good ending was nearly impossible without doing every single good karma interaction, and sparing every single enemy. I decided to cut that entire section out. Not because I had a sudden change of heart, but because I was, uh, lazy. Voice recording is hard, okay? So imagine my shock when I reached the end credits of Exodus and realized that I'd gotten the good ending. To be honest, I have no idea how I did this. It's not like I tried too hard. All I did was spare surrendering enemies and like avoid killing people that were not expressly bad. Actually, I'm lying. I know exactly what I did. I paid attention. You can infer who you shouldn't kill from contextual clues found in the environment or by simply listening to NPC conversations, which is a huge step up from the likes of Last Light where the karma system is never fully elaborated on or explained very well. Exodus provides a plethora of options for sneaky players. For one, there's the dynamic daylight system. It's not just for show, it actually changes NPC behavior. Say you want to infiltrate a heavily guarded compound silently. Daytime might not be the best time to execute a stealth operation. For one, enemies will be patrolling the base, on full alert for pesky metro rats such as yourself to rear their ugly metro rat snouts out. Secondly, it's daytime, so you lose the element of surprise pretty much by default. Here's what you do. You wait for nightfall like a normal person, grab some throwing knives, throw a silencer on your pistol and make your way toward the enemy base. At night, most settlements run a skeleton crew, giving you ample opportunity to get the jump on enemies while they're sleeping or chilling at the campfire. That's not to say infiltrating bases at night is a cakewalk, you'll still have to disarm traps and turn off lights. By the way, you don't have to actually wait for nightfall in real time, you can just pass time by resting at the nearest safe house. I think the real reason Metro Exodus' stealth is so enjoyable is that this is where all the game's immersive mechanics come together beautifully. You use your binoculars to scope out the target and do a rough headcount. Then you whip out your old backpack and assemble your gear. Come nightfall, you sneak past the pack of mutants roaming around the enemy settlement and enter the joint. Artyom's deliberately clunky movement makes it so that you have to be very deliberate and methodical in your approach. Enemies react to footsteps, activate the traps, extinguish lights, 
rights and other environmental cues. But here's the thing, you can make your life a whole lot easier by taking advantage of the dynamic weather system. Storms and rain mask the sounds of Artyom's footsteps and even small caliber weapons. Now, before concluding this section, I want to add that you can absolutely just ignore the stealth mechanics and go guns blazing. However, Artyom is quite squishy, even though he's built like a fridge, a couple of shots are all it takes to bring him down. Firefights also run the risk of collateral damage and that NPCs that you're not supposed to kill might get caught in the crossfire, thus decreasing your chances of getting the good ending. You've been warned. The Baron, fuck off, dumbass. Now that we've covered the basics of Metro Exodus, let's delve deeper into the specifics. The world, game flow, characters, all that jazz. I'm gonna briefly touch on the highlights of all chapters except the last one for obvious reasons. I don't want to give you any spoilers, I want you to actually play this game, you know? Given the cross-country nature of the story and the fact that the nuclear holocaust has turned Russia into a sparsely populated wasteland at best, the cozy quest and story hubs from 2033 and Last Light would not have made sense in Exodus. But fear not, Exodus replaces the hubs with something even better the Aurora sections, or as I like to call them, the dicking around sections. They spend two hours in Artyom's train compartment reading needlessly but endearingly worthy lore entry sections, the spend some quality time with your badass wife sections, the get wasted with your buddies in the dining car sections, the tune the radio to a jazz station and chill sections, the get to know your travel companions better and bond with them sections. Speaking of which, let's take some time to talk about Artyom's Spartan buddies. Step Sam, Idiot, Duke, Damir, Miller, and Alyosha. Actually, let's just focus on Sam. So, Sam is a former United States Marine who was stationed as a Marine security guard for the American Embassy in Moscow. When the bombs fell, he happened to be in the metro, which saved his life. Now, I played the game with English VO, and Sam has the most bug standard, basic American accent I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I wish we could smoke one in California, my man. That would be so much fun. Do you miss home? I don't know. I really got used to it. And now I learn my folks might be alive and I'm in a daze. I see. What I meant was, even though you're an American, you're our man! I'm a Spartan, Yosha. Now and forever. You're a Spartan too. This is what we are now. Why did I decide to focus on Sam specifically? Not because he is the protagonist of Exodus's second and final story expansion, rather his manner of speech gives me the perfect opportunity to talk about a national cultural relic that I've been looking for an excuse to bring up for the past four fucking years. A mid-2000s eight-episode Romanian police drama miniseries called Băieți Buni, whose title roughly translates to good guys, or uh, I guess good fellas. Now, the series centers on the efforts of two Bucharest-based police inspectors to bring down a local crime boss known as Chupanezu. Don't ask me what that nickname means, it's literally untranslatable, you have to be from here to get it, I guess. Anyways, judged on its own in a vacuum, this show is absolutely terrible, grossly derivative of American crime media down to its younger cop, older cop protagonists, the you're a glass cannon O'Malley, police commissioner and a hip-hop soundtrack composed by the hottest rap act at the time, and of course dozens of other tropes that I don't have the time nor desire to dissect here. But to us, specifically the older millennials who remember going to shady internet cafes to play GTA Vice City and buying 2040p rips of popular American shows from sweaty street vendors, this show is a gem. A reminder of simpler times, a transitional phase when the cultural aesthetics of the communist era were starting to be slowly replaced by western aesthetics. A show that gave us scenes like this one. <laughs> so what's this tangent have to do with Sam? Well, he sort of unlocked a core memory. Well, not actually a core memory because I think about this show daily. He reminded me of this scene where Chupanezu meets the American crime boss.
Hello, Chip and Ezel. I'm listening. You listening, eh? See a couple directly the prost. Yes, Tasha. One second. Deschid them. I'm listening by my friend. Care trap. What is the problem, huh? You. You're the problem. You and your boys have compromised our deal. I don't like the police climbing all over stop, my back. Stop, stop. Speak slower, Fratsuare. Yao Marat. The deal is off. What? No, 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 no. No. The deal is not off. You don't understand, this is Romania, this is my country, I'm the king here. Police, smoke, wait, wait, frate, fuck, fuck the police. I'm gonna take care of everything. And the police will look for the French guy. And they'll find the French guy and he'll lead them right to us. No. He suicide himself. Înțelegi? Stăți! E mort, mort, caput, e terminat, frățioare, tu înțelegi? You understand what I'm talking about? Not only does he speak in the cleanest American accent imaginable, he's so nondescript, black limousine, black suit, black shades, he's not a New York American or a Boston American or whatever, he's just American. Kind of like Sam. Anyways, I was absolutely shocked at how much time and effort went into creating the train segments. The death of the ambient chatter, the character interaction, the atmosphere, the lush soundscape, and oh god, you can actually hang out outside and like smoke a cigarette and take in the views. And the outside is fully modeled. Not like game forces a full fixed perspective cutscene fully modeled, but like you can actually walk around the platform and admire the landscape from multiple angles fully modeled. And yes, I know it's a loop, but it's such a varied and detailed loop. They could have just as easily kept the player inside the train, but we all know that would have gone against 4A's philosophy of immersive and naturalistic design. They go all in with this shit, man. Which is great because this is exactly my kind of shit. The first miniature open world level takes place during springtime and centers around the Volga River. This is not a courtesy visit. Between the group and Yamantau stands an old industrial bridge that must be lowered to allow the Aurora to pass. Unfortunately, the bridge is occupied by a crazed technophobic cult that worships the Tsarfish, a giant mutated catfish found in the Volga River. The leader of the cult, Silentius, blames the downfall of civilization on technology, more specifically, Electricity. He amassed followers by quote unquote destroying the anomalies hurting people with quote unquote charms. In reality, Silentius is nothing more than a charlatan, a former politician who duped people into believing his outrageous claims. Oh, and the charms? Lightning rods. Gotta hand it to the man, that's some top tier conmanship. Also, rumor has it that there is more to Silentius's relationship with the mutated catfish. The train depot where the bridge and the tsarfish are located contains a sort of feeding system that on closer inspection seems to be um, optimized to process as many human bodies as possible. So Silentius may or may not have used this feeding system to eliminate his rivals like the mayor and various officials, according to some bandits at least. Let's recap. We got a vast, bandit and mutant-led and semi-open post-industrial space dotted with all kinds of pants-shitting creepy landmarks to explore, a crazed Lovecraftian cult that worships a fish monster, and a lovingly handcrafted landscape chock full of beautiful post-apocalyptic vistas. And remember, this is the tutorial level, just a taste of what Metro Exodus has to offer. As far as tutorial levels are concerned, Volga offers a lot and then some. We are slowly introduced to basic mechanics and the game's flow, so to speak. The level starts with a linear scripted running and talking sequence with Anna, which transitions to a stealth segment that has us infiltrating a church occupied by cultists. This is also where most players will encounter the game's karma system for the first time. Essentially, you're discouraged from killing anyone besides maybe bandits and other common enemies. After the church mission, the game truly opens up. We get a boat and with it a couple of new 
aquatic enemy types because it wouldn't be a metro game if the waters weren't infested by nuclear horrors. Also my piece of shit pistol jammed while throwing down with this shrimp looking motherfucker which was not good. And then the tsarfish itself appeared out of nowhere and literally swallowed my boat which was also not good. Quick side note, remember when I gave the humanimals shit? That was just a coping mechanism. See, Metro Exodus does a great job in giving you a false sense of security with its open surface spaces. You get so absorbed into its gameplay loop, scavenging for materials, upgrading and customizing guns, listening to audio logs and reading journals and clearing bandit camps, to the point where you kinda forget about the series' horror roots, but I got a reality check 3 hours into the Volga map when a humanimal lunged at me from behind the door. It's a scripted event occurring at the beginning of a main story mission, so the developers clearly planned for this. The bastards knew that you'd let your guard down. I had let my guard down. This encounter scared the shit out of me. If you look closely, you can actually see my hands shaking on the mouse. With the cult leader dealt with and the Aurora receiving some much needed repairs, the group heads over to the Yamantau bunker where Miller believes the remnants of the Russian government have retreated. I don't have a lot to say about this level gameplay-wise, it's pretty much a linear shooting gallery, but story-wise, this is where the game briefly abandons the more grounded tone and goes into full B-movie schlock territory. Things start to look off pretty much as soon as you enter the bunker. For a place housing what is effectively a government in exile at war with occupying forces, there's a surprising lack of guards and gun emplacements. There are no security checkpoints and there is very little power or maintenance. Anna, Miller and Artyom continue to move further into the facility until they reach a pitch black meeting room. Suddenly several lights blind the trio revealing the shadowy silhouettes of the Russian government. As if this wasn't ominous enough, the leader is weirdly cheerful that the group has women and children accompanying them. And then some people jump from the ceiling and knock the trio unconscious. The jig is up. The leader reveals that the government never made it to the bunker and the war is truly over. The only only inhabitants of the bunker are building contractors and low-ranking military officials, as the war broke out before the bunker was finished. Worst of all, having run out of food shortly after the bombs fell, the inhabitants resorted to cannibalism, ensuring a steady stream of, uh nourishment by luring unsuspecting refugees via misleading radio transmissions. In other words, Artyom and co are fucked. They came all the way from Moscow only to be devoured by cannibals posing as government officials. Thankfully, Idiot and Sam drop in from the ceiling as the cannibals are prepping the trio for dinner. This kickstarts one of the most deliciously over-the-top missions I've ever played in my 25 or so years of gaming. God, I feel old. It's basically a half-hour long roller coaster level of a ride. A ro roller clo It's basically... It's basically... Had a half hour, you gun down cannibals, alright? Wave after wave of frenzied cannibals charging blindly at you, wielding clubs, knives, machetes, and like these flaming melee weapons, all while the alarms are constantly blaring and a catchy heavy metal beat is playing in the background. The action is occasionally interrupted by brief moments of calmness where you get to explore the bunker and see the scale and depravity of this operation. I never expected the Metro series to go in this direction, which is... Honestly, exactly what makes this level so great. Anyways, with the cannibals dead and their plan to settle in the bunker proven a pipe dream, the group decides to travel south to Kazakhstan to the Caspian 1 satellite center, where they hope they can find radiation heat maps to locate a habitable place to settle. Caspian is by far the absolute best level in Metro Exodus. Not only is it a much needed visual departure from the icy, wintry landscapes of Moscow and the Volga with its vast desert landscape and blinding sandstorms, it's also where the game finally comes together, mechanically and narratively. Upon reaching the now dried up Caspian Sea, the group finds itself in another bind. They're running out of water. Half of the Aurora crew is down with dehydration, so along with digging through an abandoned and possibly mutant infested satellite base for all radiation heat maps, Artyom must also secure water reserves for the crew. Anyways, because the crew can't seem to ever catch a break, the Caspian area is dominated by a hostile faction that is even worse than the crazies they butt heads with in the Volga. That faction is the Munai Baylor, led by an enigmatic and charismatic figure known as the Baron. The Munai Baylor are a group 
group of about 700 raiders made up of ex-soldiers, mobsters and Zvarog oil employees, a company that actually exists by the way, who took advantage of the war and secured the oil and water reserves in the Caspian region and also enslaved the local population. The Munai Baylor had several factors working to their advantage. First of all, due to its remote location, the Caspian region was spared from nuclear bombing. Secondly, the rapid desertification of the region allowed the group to tighten their grip on power even further, because nothing suits the interests of a monopoly better than a little ecological disaster to drive up the demand for their, uh, product. This is a real life concern by the way, the desertification of the Caspian region mind you, not the emergence of legally distinct Mad Max coded raider groups. Experts predict that during the 21st century the depth of the Caspian Sea will decrease by something between 9 and 18 meters. I'm no climate scientist, but the drying up of the largest inland body of water in the world doesn't sound too good. Also at the time of writing it's 37 degrees celsius outside. In June. I hate this fucking simulation. Thirdly, it's implied that the Baron might have been a Svarog oil employee himself. Though judging by his title, like the Baron, Oil Baron, get it? And the way he carries himself, it's unlikely he was a mere salaried employee. I think he was a D-tier oligarch or something. The kind who is just notable enough to deserve a four paragraph Wikipedia page, but not enough to escape the old suicide by ten bullets to the back of the head in a London hotel room treatment. Detailed in dry language under the death and controversy section. But the Baron created a religion and a cult of personality around himself to consolidate his power, so I guess everything worked out well for him in the end. Anyways, that's just my headcanon, you're free to disagree with me. In the comments, of course. <laughs> so the Caspian region shakes the formula a bit by introducing a few new mechanics. For one, you'll encounter a new type of human animal that emerges from the sand and ambushes you. Secondly, exploration is encouraged even further with the introduction of vehicles. The car is a godsend, as Artyom can now cut across vast swaths of map and avoid the bullet spongy mutants more easily. And by avoiding them, I mean running them over with the car. Then there is the fact that the Caspian region has a decent amount of optional areas both around the main story route and off the beaten path. These areas are filled with all sorts of goodies like crafting materials, weapon upgrades and even new guns. Some of these optional objectives like the sniper's nest at the port crane are part of side quests so the game does a great job sort of subtly nudging you to check them out. Speaking of which, a photo search through the sniper's nest reveals that the sharpshooter had been recording his comments on your hijinks on a tape recorder which is a pretty cool touch to be honest. I don't think calling us train fuckers was really necessary, but the dude seemed to hate his job so I'll let that insult slide. And by let it slide I meant sliding a bullet right into his skull. Also I got snatched by a demon. Cool. The one thing that the Caspian made me appreciate about Exodus even more is how naturally it incorporates underground areas into its open worlds. Eventually the main story will take you to Caspian 1, a satellite command center whose satellites used to monitor radiation levels in Russia and Central Asia. This level is both a throwback to old metro and a refinement of the formula at the same time. It's a linear, tightly curated half hour segment that mixes horror and action elements interspersed with brief moments of dread inducing quiet exploration to allow the brilliant environmental storytelling to shine. So the story goes that this facility remained functional up until 2019, so for 6 years after the war broke out. Unfortunately the base was devastated by the desertification of the Caspian Sea, wow what a, what a difficult word. Basically the base literally collapsed under the weight of the sand that had rapidly accumulated on the surface as the sea was drying up. The researchers, which included the mother of a resistance fighter that you meet during a main story mission were all trapped in the base, eventually succumbing to the dust, sand and debris. But here's the thing, notes and journals scattered throughout the base revealed that the higher ups actually cared about the safety of the researchers, to the point where they decided to prioritize their safety by outright ignoring directives from central command when shit started hitting the fan. After the Yamato fiasco I honestly did not expect this twist. Anyways, the base is infested with spider bugs, then the power goes out and they come in full force. 
you know the drill, blast the fuckers with the flashlight and hope for the best. Also, say what you will about Artyom being a silent protagonist, but you can't deny the way he interacts with objects tells a lot about his personality. Just look at the way Artyom inspects these cylinders. After all the shit he went through, he's still the same old goofball. And that's all I have to say about the Caspian region. This might be the best level in Metro Exodus, but believe it or not, it's not my favorite. That distinction goes to the next level. Taiga. Unlike the Volga and the Caspian chapters, the Taiga is almost entirely linear, with exploration taking a backseat role to stealth and survival. It's one of those player character gets knocked unconscious and loses his equipment only to recover it once the gimmick of the level has been properly tutorialized levels. While I'm not a big fan of this, a uh, game design trope I guess you can call it, I'ma be straight with you, I kinda dug it in Metro Exodus. I mean, the game does have a fleshed out stealth system, so what the hell, let's have a stealth level. And it's a great stealth level, I honestly have nothing special to add to the conversation gameplay wise. It's a little too on the rails for my tastes, but the visual and traditional storytelling is so on point that I'm willing to give the game a pass. Plus, I always love a good video game crossbow. And then there's this scene. The premise of the chapter is that following the previous failed attempts to find a habitable place to settle, a desperate miller sends Artyom and Alyosha to scout the forest valley and Kazakhstan. As the duo make their way along the riverbank, an avalanche occurs right above the tracks sending the rail car tumbling into the river. Artyom is dragged out of the river by a woman who assures him that no harm would come to the group as long as they don't do anything stupid. Armed with a crossbow that he picked up from a dying man, Artyom makes his way up the valley to rendezvous with Alyosha and make it to the Aurora as it's crossing the crumbling hydroelectric dam that had prevented toxic waste from spilling into the area. Now, apart from the bandits, the Taiga chapter doesn't have an antagonistic faction per se, mainly because they're basically children. Well, not literally children. Okay, let me explain. The faction inhabiting the forest valley are known as the Children of the Forest. They are a group of children who were stranded at a scout camp when the bombs fell and were raised by their camp master, whom they have come to call the Teacher. That's Teacher with capital T remember that. With the children's parents likely dead, he took it upon himself to teach the children survival skills. Unfortunately, to the teacher's at first confusion and then sheer horror, the children came to see him as a prophet and his teachings as scripture. The teacher taught the children to fight only in self-defense, but after a particularly brutal bandit attack, a group of male students, led by Roman, decided to take a more proactive approach and launch an offensive attack on the bandits. This caused the teacher to become disillusioned at what he'd created and moved to an abandoned church where he YouTubed himself. Years later, the children have split apart into two sub-factions, each with its own interpretation of the man's teachings. The pirates, led by Roman, and the pioneers, led by Olga, the same woman who drags Artyom out of the river. The former attacks, robs, and executes trespassers without giving it a second thought, while the latter lives in peaceful isolationism. So that's an interesting way to put the game's morality system to use. These people might be adults physically, but mentally they're pretty much children. They have a very childlike view of the world which is further distorted by their literal interpretation of the teachings. Like, they don't really understand why bullying is wrong, all they know is that the teacher's scriptures forbids it. They call death 
taking the final exam, which is all kinds of fucked up because this implies that they don't have a grasp on how death actually works, which further explains the pirates' violent tendencies. The pirates don't just rob trespassers, they torture and display their mutilated bodies to strike fear in outsiders. I guess that explains why this chapter is linear. I assume the devs felt this linear guided format was the best way to make sure players are 100% invested into the chapter's narrative and emphasize the survivalist and nature versus nurture themes. But that's a discussion for people way smarter than me. And that's pretty much it for this video. Metro Exodus is an absolute gem, an artistically accomplished AAA first-person shooter the likes of which we are unlikely to see again too soon given the industry's terminally and shitified state. A sequel is in the works, but we're told we shouldn't expect it to drop too soon. Let's hope Embracer doesn't get any ideas. Thanks for watching. A special thank you to my wonderful patrons whose generosity makes these videos possible. I'll see you next time.